Thank you, Ian, uh, and thank you for making the, the time to come along today, everybody. Uh, I'm going to attempt to achieve a few things up here. Uh, the first thing is to educate you on what West Oz Investment Company and West Oz Funds Management is all about. The second thing is a bit of an update on WA. Then I'll talk briefly about the portfolio. And finally, I'll try to deliver all of you to a morning tea, bang on time. Quickly skip over the disclaimer. So the West Oz Investment Company difference now, I wouldn't look on this slide so much as a pitch, as a philosophy of how we run our money and why we run money like we do. Um, the West Oz product wasn't designed to fill a gap that we thought was missing in your portfolios. Pure and simply, this, this company was designed to make money and then return that money to shareholders, primarily through fully frank dividends. So we're currently in our 14th year of investment. We are unashamedly focused in West Australia. Uh, and why do we do that? Well, quite simply, we do that because we spend the most time in Western Australia. And effectively, we have that market to ourselves. We're the only fund that's purely focused on ideas sourced out of WA. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean all the assets are in WA or all the people are in WA. It just means there is a connection there, whether it be through the people or the assets of the company or both. Um, so we're stuck to our knitting doing that for 14 years now. You know, the proof in the pudding of that strategy is that we've paid out $156 million of income from these funds. So we've paid out more money in these funds than we raised. When we raised that money, we promised if we made money, we would pay it back to shareholders. In our prospectus, we talked about paying back 50% of realized profits. We've actually paid back closer to 100% of the profits after tax. So the purpose of this vehicle is to make money and pay that money back. It's not to grow fun. Um, because we are invested alongside shareholders. So West Oz Funds Management, the company I work for, is a subsidiary of a listed company called Euros Limited. Euros is a Perth-based uh, diversified financial services company. Now, Euros has $40 million invested in West Oz Investment Company, which is 27% of the fund. So effectively, the fund manager is, is highly aligned with shareholders through that $40 million um, investment which is quite unique. Um, the investment team has been fairly consistent over time. Um, I'm obviously not from Western Australia, uh, but I have lived here for 15 years. Um, I'm actually the newbie on the West Oz team, and I've been there for 12 years now. Um, my, my other two colleagues have been there, um, well, before inception of West Oz. Um, they designed the company and formulated it, so they've been there for, for all 14 years. So a very consistent team, employing a consistent process. A quick snapshot of the company's uh, metrics. So $153 million market cap today, slightly less today, actually, about $150 million today. These are month-end numbers. Um, interestingly enough, you can actually buy a dollar for 90 cents at the moment. The shares are trading around about a 10% discount, and I'll cover why that may be, and I'll cover discounts in the sector in a few slides. Um, we pay a six, six cent fully franked dividend currently. We've done that for three years. We're targeting that for, for this year. We never promised, but we're targeting six cents for this year, as we have done for the previous three years. Uh, that gives you a fully franked yield on the share price of 5.2%. Those dividends to date have all been fully franked. So the current gross income yield, if you're going to compare it to a cash product, or what you're getting out of the bank is 7.5%, including those franking credits. In terms of shareholder composition, I've talked about the parent company uh, having $40 million invested alongside you. So euros count for 27%. Of the, of the register, and um, the register is still, still quite WA-centric, um, but it is gradually migrated, migrating more towards the East Coast. Um, the other notable shareholder we'll be speaking on later on today, and that's Wilson Asset Management, and they currently account for just under 7% of the register, and they've been there for some time, enjoying the dividends, um, like the rest of us. Um, just very quickly in terms of performance, I'm going to talk about the WA economy a bit today, so there's just one number I want to focus on here. Because obviously WA hasn't been the land of milk and honey for the past, well, four or five years, as I'll show in my presentation. So the three-year number for the investment portfolio is 22% per annum in terms of returns. And I'm just prove, I just want to point out here that although we are WA-based and WA-focused, we're not necessarily dependent on what happens in the WA economy. Um, we're very proud of that longer-term track record of nearly 14% uh, per annum. Um, we're focused on absolute returns, so we don't have a benchmark that we compare ourselves to. I've just put two up there for your interest. 
um, the small ordinaries and, and the bank bill index over that time. So payout um, is driven by the performance, and we think that consequently drives the price. Um, to date, we've paid out $1.29 in total income to shareholders. We've also bought back a little bit of stock that hasn't been included in these returns to shareholders. That's been through 90 cents of fully frank dividends, which grossed up 39 cents uh, for the franking credit, and a fairly consistent um, track record there. So moving on to, to, to the sort of sticky subject in licks of, of payout uh, uh, and price and discounts uh, versus NTA, this slide is just, just I, I believe that performance drives your payout and your payout predominantly um, drives your price. So this slide is an attempt to illustrate that. The bars represent 17 licks, and they're all Australian-focused licks, and they've all been around for a minimum of five years and have a market cap of over $100 um, million. Um, I've listed them in the same order on both slides. So sl slide A is the same lick on, on the left-hand chart as it is on the right-hand chart. So the left-hand side gives you yield on NTA. So we've got a range of yields there, and um, we run from 7.4% on, on the NTA, not the share price at the top to, to 1.6% at the bottom. Um, the median number, interestingly enough, is, right, is bang in line with the market at, at 4%. Now, I've quite simply just taken that line and moved it across to the, to the chart on the right, and the chart on the right is the premiums and discounts of those same licks um, as, as they sat as at the end of August, according to, to the ASX Investment Products Monthly, which is an excellent um, report you can access. So we can see a very strong correlation there. So, so the company that's currently yielding 1.6% as NTA is currently trading at a 17% uh, discount. Uh, and your company A at the top, yielding 7.4%, currently trading on a 20% on a um, premium. Um, other things matter. Uh, you know, so if you look at Westall's, we're trading a slight discount. So what's that due to? Well, it could be due to other things other than yield, but I still think there is a correlation with payout there. And um, we've been paying a fairly consistent dividend for the last few years. If you were to look at you know, the licks towards the bottom end of that premium to discount uh, graph, they've probably cut their dividend. And if we look at, uh, certainly I know the two licks at the top of that, of that premium dis discount uh, graph have done a very good job of growing their dividend. Now I've been watching the lick sector for, for 15 years. And one of the fascinating things is when companies are trading at a reasonable discount, it's quite often when, when they've been through the worst time, so you get a double whammy on the way up. They start performing better, uh, and the discount closes in, so you can actually get higher returns than you otherwise would have done in, say, the managed fund sector. And that's one of the things uh, I like about the listed investment company sector. So moving on to the WA economy. Just excuse me while I have a drink of water. Um, this is a graph of state final demand. Um, and what we're showing here, quite simply, is that WA hasn't been a very flash place for the last four or five years. Now, politicians in the country tend to focus on GDP, and at the state level, they focus on GSP, um, gross state product. Now, that includes um, the export benefit the Australian economy has, uh, and WA in particular has a very large export benefit. So if you look at the GSP of WA, it only shows one down year in 2017, and some very sort of solid growth before that. You strip out that export benefit, and this is what the economy in WA looks like, and it's certainly what the economy in WA has felt like over the last four or five years. So I'm not standing up here today to tell you that everything in WA is rosy and it's all back on again. Um, I'm simply here to say we've been through some pretty dark times. People aren't quite aware of how bad things have been, and we are just nosing our way out of it. Now, we think the trend from here is up, and we think there's a few reasons why that might surprise to the upside uh, going forward, and I'll run through these. In the, next, in the next few slides. Importantly though, year-on-year -year growth in West Australia has, has been positive for the last two readings, uh, be, albeit marginally. So there's four components to the domestic economy that I've laid out on the slide. I'll deal with the really easy components first, and, that, and that's government expenditure in, in the form of CapEx and just ongoing expenditure. They're the two smaller numbers in the chart, two smaller parts of the economy. They represent about 30% of the economy in, in total. Um, most of us are aware that government expenditure only moves uh, in one direction, although I will give credit where credit's due, and in WA at the moment we are currently seeing 
some public sector wage constraint and, and private wages are actually growing quicker than public sector wages for the first time in, in quite some time. And recently released government numbers in WA were, were better than expected. They weren't particularly flash, but they were definitely better than expected. So moving on to the two, uh, the two areas that really drive the economy in WN and indeed any Western world economy, they're both the private sector. Um, household consumption has been growing very slowly, and that's a function of slower population growth and, and less confidence in, in that population. And, and private capital formation has been the big swing factor in WA and in the Australian economy, and that includes all things, including the resource boom expenditure, but it also includes residential uh, construction, uh, property and equipment spend. Uh, now, quite simply, we think that's obviously it's, got, it's gone through a structural high and it's currently in a structural low, but we also think it's in a cyclical low. And, and, and that number is unsustainably low at the moment, and we see that turning around going forward. Household consumption is the biggest driver, and I'm going to concentrate on that for the next couple um, of slides. So this chart in front of you is, is my favourite chart on economics, probably in Australia at the moment, because I think that tells the story of the country for the last, well, for the last decade or so, but the last four or five years in particular. So the graph in front of you represents um, net migration on a rolling 12-month basis, on a state-by-state -state basis for the bigger, for the larger states in the country. Um, and the first thing I point out is this is a very cyclical piece of data, so it moves up and down through time. Uh, the second thing to point out, obviously, is that WA is, is at a very low point. Uh, Victoria and New South Wales are, are coming off their peaks. And that reflects very much what we're seeing in these economies. Now, this is interstate and overseas migration. That actually turned negative in WA last year, uh, briefly for the first time ever. Well, I come from Ireland, and I've been lucky enough to live in some really quite nice places, Dublin, Edinburgh, London, even Paris, briefly. And, you know, take it from me, West Australia is a, pr a pretty nice place to live. People are going to keep coming there when, when the confidence um, returns. Uh, the other point I make on this graph is the other chart that looks very like this is multi-residential uh, multi starts. Uh, around the country, so apartment uh, numbers mirror these, these lines um, very closely. Uh, and we've got an apartment uh, de developer in WA in our portfolio for, for that reason um, at the moment. So a fairly cyclical piece of data, WA coming off the low. Population growth in WA as a whole is currently running at 0.8%. It's off a low of 0.6%. The country's average at the moment is 1.7%. And interestingly enough, WA pre-boom the 20-year the average pre-boom, 20 to 25-year average pre-boom was 1.8% per annum. So there's some way to go in terms of uh, population growth rebound in WA, and we think that's happening at the moment. That big down dip in WA, the up dip, the upturn and the down dip is quite simply, you know, uh, people arriving to, to build the, the resources, uh, equipment and construction projects, uh, and, and they've been rolling off steadily, and we think that's coming to an end as, as the last... Uh, construction project is finished in the LNG sector. So we talk about coming from a low base. We also like to talk about capacity. So property, property and what's happening in property in the East Coast in Australia is all the rage at the moment. Um, these charts speak to the capacity of, of the consumer, we think. So the light blue line on, on both charts, we've got WA on the left-hand side, New South Wales on the right-hand side. Uh, the light blue line is wage growth, and interestingly enough, that's been almost identi identical post the GFC and the, recovery, the long, slow recovery the world has experienced from, from the GFC. So wage growth in both economies has been running at about 24%. Now, at the start of this period, uh, price to income for, for houses in West Australia and New South Wales was roughly equal to six and a half times income. We're seeing today at less than six times in, in, in Western Australia and north of nine times in, in Sydney. So house prices is, is, is the dark line. House prices in, in WA are marginally lower than, than they were eight years ago. In, in Sydney, they're, they're, they're almost 80% higher. So house prices on the East Coast have been running at two to three times wage prices. On the West Coast, they've, they've, not, been, they've not been keeping uh, track. And all we're saying here is that at some point in time, those lines have to meet. Um, and we think there's a reasonable amount of capacity in the WA economy for, for certainly house price appreciation once confidence returns. 
So moving on to confidence, um, numbers were released uh, two weeks ago by the Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Western Australia, um, touting this chart, which shows uh, consumer confidence over a five-year period. And you know, the headline read, WA consumer confidence is the highest it's been for five years. Now that's just a that's, that's just a state and time thing. I would not say the WA population is feeling as confident as they did in 2013. They're just simply feeling more confident about the next six or 12 months uh, versus any other period over the last five years. So again, I'd reiterate, I'm not saying it's all back on. I'm just saying we're turning around um, slowly but surely. And confidence driver, jobs drive, drive confidence. They, they, they drive population, they drive uh, migration. We are starting to see, certainly we've seen in the mining sector for some time, pockets uh, of tightness appearing. It's certainly not appearing economy-wide in West Australia at the moment. Employment rate is still quite high uh, at over 6%, all that, albeit driven by a participation rate which is, which is higher than the rest of the nation. But job vacancy growth is growing a lot. These are rolling 12-month numbers, up 27%. Uh, 12 months in the previous 12 months, point in time numbers are actually up 43%. And these little spot fires in terms of employment tightness are happening and they, and they are growing. So two years ago it was, it was mining engineers. Australia is currently producing a sixth of the mining graduates that produced um, five, five or six years ago. Um, it's, mo it's moved on through other, other areas of the resource sector and we're starting for the first time to see it happening a bit broader, albeit not across, certainly not across the economy as a whole just yet. Moving on to a micro level of, of how we actually do things. So the WA economy is important. It's important in terms of perception um, for our fund and certainly drives some of our companies. It doesn't drive all of them. When we're looking at companies, the first thing we look at are, are, are the people uh, because at the end of the day, our shareholders are entrusting money with us and we're on entrusting that with, with other people. And what we're looking for there are people who are exper experienced their experience of doing what they're doing. In WA, you might get somebody who, you know, was running a was running a zinc, a zinc hopeful one year, and the next year he's back with the uranium thing. They're not the kind of people we really get attracted to. We get attracted to people who've been there and done it before, uh, and also importantly, we get attract, attracted to people who are putting their own money on the line. So we we have a lot of skin in the game through the through the holding in the funds, and we expect that from management teams and boards and the companies we're investing in as well. Capital, I've put down there, and capital is important to us on a couple of levels. The first thing is, we quite like companies with a lot of assets, because when the inevitable downturn happens or hiccup occurs, that, that gives you a valuation uh, foundation. But we also are, are not great lovers of debt. We've never accused a company of having a lazy balance sheet. We're massive believers in the option value of cash for ourselves and for other companies. And cash flow is important for, for two reasons. One, we, we don't really go for exploration companies. We go for companies where we can evaluate the cash flow off a, off a proven uh, asset and proved up asset. But we also look a lot at cash flow when we're analyzing companies that are up and running. We, we, we pay a lot more attention to historic cash flow performance than we do to earnings forecasts. Um, we, we think that is, the, that is the proof of the pudding. And in terms of value, we're very old-fashioned as well. We like to look at price-to-book ratios a lot. Uh, we like to look at dividend yields and PEs. We, we veer away from the funkier things like EV to EBITDAs, which is earnings before interest, tax depreciation, and assets. We refer that to as earnings before costs. Uh, and when, when people start valuing sectors on, on things like EV to sales or EV to, to resource ounce or reserve ounce, it's, it's our experience that that's the bell tolling in that, in that particular sector. How does that apply to, to an example in our portfolio? Well, Australis Oil and Gas is, is currently the biggest holding in our portfolio. It's primarily got there through performance. Uh, it is probably worth pointing out that the, although these are WA people, the assets are based um, overseas. overseas. Um, so in terms of experience, uh, the people driving this company also were behind a company called Aurora Oil and Gas. And they took that from a, from a $28 million company to a plus $1 billion M&A um, transaction during the last oil price run. And importantly for us, they've reinvested um, some of their money uh, from that experience in this company. So, so they currently own uh, over 11% of the company. And you know, they've, paid, they've paid for that um, equity alongside shareholders like ourselves. 
In terms of capital, the, 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 current, the company is currently in net cash and it's got undrawn debt facilities available. It also has producing assets uh, and some large land holdings with, with some decent um, upside, we think. And in terms of cash flow, they have cash flow from their producing asset and they have real cash flow growth potential um, going forward. So these assets and that cash flow give us an opportunity to value the company. And importantly, we can see a lot of value enhancing catalysts going forward for this company. The main reason we were excited about this company when we bought it, we liked the oil price outlook at the time. Quite simply, the oil price was not priced to incentivize any further development or exploration for the foreseeable future at 40 to 50 bucks. But at that point in time, nearly everything on the Australian stock exchange was pricing in 70 buck plus oil. So there weren't that many attractive opportunities. We certainly owned a couple of them. Uh, whereas this company, if oil moved from, from $50 to $70, it absolutely made all the difference in the economics of their project. Um, they're an exciting point in their lifespan at the moment. They've just started drilling uh, on some of the ground they have that's not currently producing. And we think if they produce the results that the previous owner of these, of these, um, of these land holdings pr produced from Wales prior to the last downturn, then the market will get very excited um, about the company going forward. So in terms of our portfolio, this is, this is the portfolio as of, of the end of September. I mean, the first thing to note is we've stuck to our knitting. All, all those companies either have a WA asset or based in WA. In fact, one of them was based in WA and, and no longer is, and, and its assets uh, aren't based there either, but we have historic experience with, with that uh, management team. So we're very much stuck to our, our knitting there. We're currently 11% cash. Uh, the previous month, we were 31% we were cash. 11% um, uh, is probably around about average for us. Uh, what have we done with that, with that money? Over the last little while, well, we saw an opportunity in, in, the, in the base metals space especially, and in the gold space, as, as metal prices were really the only asset worldwide that reacted in any great fashion to, to, these, to these trade spats, and, and they sold off quite sharply, and we thought they sold off to levels that quite simply wouldn't encourage um, further supply to come on or further um, exploration. Uh, I've talked about Australis, maybe just touch on the other two uh, big holdings there in the, in the top three, because they are both property-based. Um, Finbar Group is probably one of the very few companies you can buy, buy that offers pure exposure um, to Western Australia. It's a Western Australian-based, Western Australian-focused um, apartment developer. Uh, Cedarwoods properties ha has, uh, pro has projects uh, countrywide. It's been a very long-term um, holding force as well. In ter terms of management board holdings in those companies, the board and or management of those companies hold a minimum of 10% in the company. Um, Cedar Woods, I think, is actually currently north of 30% of the company. I talked briefly about a bit of wage inflation and wage tightness returning to the mining sector. So although we, up, and, up until a month ago, we had very few miners in this portfolio, certainly outside of the gold space, very few miners in this portfolio, we do hold more contra contractors than we typically hold through the cycle, and we do see inflation returning uh, in terms of costs uh, to, to the mining sector, and the contractors um, should benefit um, from that going, going forward. Um, I think the bell's tolling for, 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 for cups of tea and coffee. Just very quickly, um, I'd like to thank you all for your, for your time today, taking the time to listen to us. Um, I will be here all day uh, with my colleague, Tim Banfield, who's head of distribution and marketing for us. I'd encourage you to come and talk to us. If you don't want to talk to us today, you can subscribe um, to our weekly email, or please uh, feel free to give us a call at, at any point in time. We love talking to our shareholders, and we love talking to prospective shareholders. Um, so thank you for your time today, everybody. Thanks, Ian.